This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, where the Green Party's national convention is underway. I'm joined by Dr. Jill Stein, Green Party 2012 presumptive presidential nominee, and by Sherry Hankala, Green Party's vice presidential nominee, national coordinator of the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. Uh, Dr. Jill Stein, talk about the decision you made in choosing Sherry Hunkala. Who is on your shortlist? Um, we had a wonderful shortlist. Um, I'm not sure that I'm, I'm at liberty to disclose who exactly was on it. Why did you choose Sherry Hunkala? Well, Sherry stands out as the leading advocate for poor people, for justice, for the fight against predatory banks, uh, for the fight against mortgage foreclosures, uh, fighting on behalf of children most at risk, uh, fighting for, for justice and for a fair economy. And Sherry is an incredibly inspired human being and mother. Uh, who was a homeless uh, single mother and who began to take over empty buildings, saying there are buildings that are, there are homes that are empty there, and there are people like me who are sleeping out on the street. What's wrong with this picture? I'm going to go sleep in that empty home. And, you know, Sherry's, um, Sherry is unstoppable and I think exemplifies the fighting spirit that is alive and well across America that we hope to give voice to in this campaign. Well, well, the P is word is certainly about. one that's not really very much talked about uh, by exactly. the presidential candidates, poverty. Uh, Sherry Hankla, used to seeing you ahead of marching at the presidential conventions, uh, marching for poor people's rights in this country, uh, now being chosen as a vice presidential candidate. Your feelings today? Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, I think I'm prepared to take on this challenge. Uh, I was absolutely shocked when I was chosen, uh, but I think it's a real statement of the Stein campaign. Uh, and it meant so much to people across the entire country. Once the announcement was made, I literally received hundreds of letters, uh, not just from people in this country, but from folks around the entire world. Was it a hard decision to decide to do this? It was definitely the hardest decision I've ever made in my life. Um, because I have uh, a family out there, uh, and I, uh, you know, I have two sons, and they're used to their mother bringing attention to them and the various different choices that I make. And uh, I asked my 10 year old, Guillermo, and uh, he immediately did the happy dance in the living room, so I knew it was a go. <laughs> so, what do you plan to represent? Um, you ran for sheriff of Philadelphia on a platform of no evictions, no foreclosures. I want to ask you about an announcement President Obama made in February. Bank of America and four other large banks had signed on to a $25 billion mortgage settlement to resolve claims over faulty foreclosures and the mishandling of requests for loan modifications. President Obama described it as a landmark settlement. Under the terms of this settlement, America's biggest banks banks that were rescued by taxpayer dollars, will be required to right these wrongs. And that means more than just paying a fee. These banks will put billions of dollars towards relief for families across the nation. They'll provide refinancing for borrowers that are stuck in high interest rate mortgages. They'll reduce loans for families who owe more on their homes than they're worth. And they will deliver some measure of justice for families that have already been victims of abusive practices. That was President Obama. Our headline today, Wells Fargo Bank has agreed to pay a settlement of at least $175 million for discriminating against black and Latino borrowers. Um, talk about what Obama said. Uh, it sounds good, uh, but in reality, it never happened. Uh, the, the families in America, the six million families that have lost their homes to foreclosure, uh, none of them received any kind of bailout. Uh, my sister herself was a victim of Wells Fargo. She has African-American children, and uh, they are now homeless in my mother's living room. They had a home for 20 years. Uh, both her and her husband, full-time workers, worked around the clock, were victims of predatory lending. 
and uh, the money that was supposed to bail out the American people, a great deal of that was written off and uh, there was no uh, regulations of, around what they should do with that money. And uh, actually, the week before, uh, you know, finding out that I was uh, chosen as uh, the vice presidential candidate, uh, I spent last week facing the sheriff's department with um, Rhonda Lancaster and Fran Scarsborough. Fran Scarsborough had owned her home for 25 years, uh, and then was illegally thrown out by Chase Bank. And then Rhonda Lancaster uh, now has had her home taken from her by Fannie Mae, and we were able to stop that foreclosure. What other issues are you going to take on as vice presidential candidate traveling across this country? I think the, the issues that I'm going to focus on um, are the section of the population that has totally been forgotten about. Neither um, Obama or Mitt Romney have raised any of these issues. When you talk about the P word, poverty, um, they haven't talked, to, talked about the mortgage foreclosure crisis. They haven't talked about the school to prison pipeline. They haven't talked about uh, the disabled. Uh, in Philadelphia, there was 125 uh, disabled individuals that lost their jobs. And this is at a time when people are losing their jobs all across the entire country. Well, there's a high chance that they're never going to see employment ever again. Um, that is until uh, Jill and I are elected and we take the unemployment centers and turn them into employment centers. Earlier this year, Michael Schur, co-host of the Young Turks talk show, interviewed Roseanne Barr and asked her why she's making a bid to be the Green Party's presidential nominee. Originally, the party that I found in myself that I was running was the Green Tea Party because, uh, you know, as I spoke today about a synthesis between capital and social, uh, which I think is the future and what needs to happen. I call it peopleism. I feel that that represents fully all the American people, the true 99 percent who knows that, who know that this is just a scam from top to bottom. But I chose the Green Party because of ballot access, because I like the 10 key values of the Green Party. Uh, they're very good. They're very basic. I think everyone would agree if they'd read them, everyone agrees with them. That was Roseanne Barr, and we spent a good deal of time talking to Roseanne Barr as well. Uh, Dr. Jill Stein, the actual vote um, you were running against her for the nomination is tomorrow here in Baltimore at the Green Party convention. Your main differences? Uh, with Roseanne, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, similar policies and positions. We had a debate in San Francisco uh, a couple months back where uh, you know, it, it was hard for people to find the differences. I think the differences between us really are uh, historic and what we do. I've been an organizer and sort of a grassroots, uh, you know, uh, advocate on the whole spectrum of issues. And Roseanne has been a spokesperson in her own right, not actually building the networks and doing the on the ground. Uh, advocacy, but from her own position as an artist and, and an actress, and would that more celebrities followed in her footsteps, this would be a wonderful thing. Well, let's talk about third-party politics for a minute. In 2004, as George W. Bush and John Kerry um, uh, wrapped up their campaigns, Democracy Now! spoke to the late legendary historian Howard Zinn. He explained why he, along with Noam Chomsky and others, signed a petition calling for people to vote for Kerry in swing states. People should vote for Kerry in the swing states. And I think the reason is this, and I don't know if I'm speaking for all the other signers of the petition, but probably I, I would guess that this is a, their thinking. Certainly it's my thinking. And that is, you know, that uh, admire Nader enormously. I mean, Nader stands, uh, you know, miles high above these other candidates in terms of his morality, in terms of his contribution to the country. Uh, but the, this election election is the wrong place for him to put his great energy and talent. And it's, it's a waste of his, uh, his stature uh, to put his, uh, all of his work that he has done into counting the votes in an election, which he can't win anyway. And, be, and the Bush administration is so dangerous. 
That was Howard Zinn uh, talking about why people should vote for Kerry over Nader in 2004. Dr. Jill Stein. That was then, and this is now. Um, and let me say, I think the last four years have been quite instructive to people. Really, the last 10 years, there has been this campaign of fear that we need to silence ourselves politically, that we dare not stand up for what we believe and for the solutions that we desperately need. And a lot of progressives uh, bought into that over the past decade, and we saw third-party politics really uh, shrink. Uh, uh, quite significantly. But now we have 10 years of experience. And looking back, I think people are quite clear now, or shall we say, uh, this is a big wake up moment, that silence, political silence, has not been an effective strategy. We haven't moved forward. In fact, the politics of fear has actually delivered all those things we were afraid of the expanding war, the attack on our civil liberties, the expanding so called free trade agreements that offshore our jobs and undermine wages here at home, the meltdown of the climate, the massive Wall Street bailouts, all these things we were supposed to be quiet in order to avoid, we've gotten in spades, all the more so because we have silenced ourselves. We're saying it's time to replace the politics of fear with the politics of courage. This is how we move You ahead. already debated Romney in That's 2002 right. for governor in Massachusetts. You were Green Party rainbow candidate? That's right, a green rainbow candidate. So how did you end up debating a major party candidate? Because as we know in the presidential race, rarely do you have third party candidates included. Exactly. Um, we, um, we managed to get into the debates by insisting on it, you know, and to some extent that's a model for our campaign. We need real changes here. Our lives are at risk, our jobs, our economy, our climate. We really need to take our future into our own hands and insist that we move forward in this election. And in previous races, we've entered into them with that. Uh, that sense of empowerment, as Alice Walker says, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing they have it to start with. Well, we know it, and there are a lot of people out there who know it. And we're not going to sit back and watch our future uh, continue to unravel the way that it has been over the past decade, actually over the past many decades, under both Democrats and Republicans. We are standing up to say that we need a politics of, by, and for the people. There are good solutions. We're going to drive them forward. Forward. Sherry Hunkler, can you talk about the growth of the Green Party? Also, uh, qualifying for matching funds, uh, the significance of this for both of you? Uh, I think it's incredibly ex uh, exciting uh, that people across this entire country have been holding house parties and doing whatever they possibly can to raise the money for the matching funds. And I definitely think that this is uh, historic. Um, I think that. Uh, uh, you know, we're just really excited to be able to uh, involve the majority of the people that are in this country. And in Kensington, where I live, um, people didn't know anything about what is the Greens, what, what is the Green Party. And now all it takes is a major uh, voter education registration drive, which people are doing across this country. It takes about two seconds to switch people from Republican or Democrat to a Green. And, and I would just add to that, you know, that what happened with matching funds is unprecedented. Uh, in our minds, that's another sign that we are at this historic moment where the American people have, have hit the breaking point. And our campaign is how we turn that breaking point into a tipping point to start taking back our democracy and the peaceful, just, green future we deserve and pushing these solutions forward. The fact that we got to matching funds happened, you know, because of a grassroots engagement and a sense of, you know, uh, Rosa Clemente in the last election said the Green Party is no longer the alternative, it's the imperative. And I think increasingly people are realizing that, yes, we do need to do this and we can do it so ourselves. So let's talk about money and politics. Um, I want to ask you about the 2010 Citizens United ruling that allows corporations to spend unlimited amounts of money in federal elections. Um, let's turn to a clip of Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Lessig commenting on Citizens United. 
It's not as if on January 20th, 2010, the day before Citizens United was decided, democracy in America was humming along perfectly well and then was broken by the Supreme Court. Democracy was already broken in the United States in 2010, and it's broken because the tiniest slice of Americans, 0.26 percent, funds give more than $200 in a congressional campaign, 0.05 percent max out in a congressional campaign. The tiniest slice of the top 1 percent of America funds elections in America. And that reality will always, whether corporations or persons or not, corrupt the system in Washington. And the only solution to that problem is not just limiting the ability of corporations or private individuals to spend unlimited amounts in political expenditures. It's also to begin to talk openly and honestly about the need to fund publicly public elections. That was Harvard professor Lawrence Lessig. On Citizens United, Dr. Jill Stein, what are you going to do about it? It's a Supreme Court decision. Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. I, I agree with the professor that it's not that Citizens United made all the difference. We had big problems with money and politics going back for, for decades, really forever. But the problem became uh, really serious uh, beginning in the 1970s when the Democrats made a decision to adopt the fundraising strategies of the Republicans. And at that point, you began to see both parties uh, under similar pressure to adopt uh, similar policies. So yes, I, you know, we do need a constitutional amendment, and I think there's a lot that the president can do. The president needn't be simply the uh, commander in chief. The president can also be uh, the organizer in chief if she so chooses to do so. The president could be on primetime TV and making public service announcements and conducting uh, email uh, information campaigns. Campaigns like a move to amend, I'm sorry, like moveon.org that moved on from the Democratic Party and actually had a broader agenda. There are so many strategies that a president could bring into play to help draw public attention to not only the problem but how we can solve it with a constitutional amendment to make clear that uh, corporations are not persons and money is not speech. So you're supporting constitution? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. um, let me turn to Fareed Zakari of CNN for a minute, who responded to a viewer who asked, quote, why there aren't more serious third party candidates in the United States. This is part of what Fareed Zakari responded. America just does not have a very broad ideological spectrum. If you look at America's two parties, uh, they're actually very close together in terms of their their ideological differences uh, both american parties would be would fit comfortably as, as kind of center right parties in europe uh, the democrats and the republicans you have n no real social democratic party uh, you have no real hyper nationalist parties if you look at the the kind of width of the european political spectrum the united states occupies a kind of narrow position on it. So it makes sense that we don't have 10 parties. That was Fareed Zakaria. Uh, your response, Sherry Hankala. That, I mean, Fareed Zakaria talking about how the American parties, Democrats and Republicans, would fit comfortably into, well, as center-right parties in Europe. Well, I think that the American people are not happy with the one-party system in this country. And I think that they've shown that by not voting. Uh, you know, large sections of the population uh, are just sitting out. Uh, and I think that they're sitting out elections because it's like a protest vote. Um, it's not just because they're not interested in what's happening in this country, they just don't see that their vote actually matters. Um, but our campaign gives an opportunity for people to see themselves. Uh, because we represent the 99 percent. We don't represent uh, corporate America, and our campaign is not going to be uh, directed by corporate America. What are your plans? How are you going to run this presidential race? And uh, are you making a concerted effort to get into the debates? Who do you appeal to? And also, where are you traveling? I think the, the first thing is, is really all about participation, and that's the exciting thing. When I talked about the hundreds, uh, and it's soon going to turn into the thousands of people, uh, you know, going door knocking, um, you know, there's many ways that we can change things in this country, and it doesn't just come from money. We can look all around the world and be inspired. Um, you know, history doesn't just go in a flat line. There's leaps that take place. And I think we're going to see a leap with this election. What is your strategy, Dr. Jill Stein? 
you know, the name of the game, as Sherry is saying, is really to uh, engage the people who are currently locked out, large constituencies who feel they don't have a voice in this election. Students, for example. There are about 36 million uh, students and recent graduates who are basically indentured servants, and there is no difference, essentially, between the Obama and the Romney plans, which uh, is essentially to stay the course, you know, in this devastating student debt. So we're reaching out to students. We're reaching out to the unemployed, the underemployed. Uh, people who need real health care, the Medicare for All constituency, traveling the climate around community, the country. traveling and also doing outreach. Because if you look at what happened in Tunisia and and in Tahrir Square, you know this was com it completely came out of left field. Uh, it did not have the backing of organized media or the organized political parties. Will you be outside protesting at the Republican and Democratic conventions? I saw you there last time, Sherry Hankala. Absolutely, wouldn't miss it for the world. And there's actually a Romneyville that's already been set up in uh, Tampa, Florida. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you'll be safe this time and you won't be arrested like you were the last time. <laughs> Uh, but ab absolutely, I mean, we have a responsibility to uh, raise all the horrible things that are happening. Uh, we talked to some steel workers uh, yesterday. Uh, they're about ready to uh, close down their plant here in Baltimore with 2,500 workers. And uh, if we have to, um, we'll support workers in occupying their plants to hold on to their jobs. And for a question, you're often asked, Jill Stein, if you have a toss-up race, if a swing state like Ohio very close, um, the comment of someone like Howard Zinn, uh, how someone should vote for Green Party, uh, Democratic Party, or Republican Party? Yeah, you know, I think we need the politics of courage in this day and age. That's actually how we've always moved forward with a social movement on the ground and an independent political party that can articulate the agenda and the solutions that can move us forward. We're in this for the long haul. We are building. One of these days we will turn the White House into a greenhouse, and that will be a really good thing uh, for the people of this nation and the world. What would you do in Syria right now? Well, you know, for, for starters, we would certainly uphold the uh, the international treaty, which is being negotiated right now, which you covered, uh, I believe, last week. Navi Pillay, the, uh, uh, the human rights uh, coordinator with uh, the United Nations, made the point that armaments, which are being sold to both sides of this conflict, have absolutely blown it up. You'd be out front on the arms trade treaty. We sure would, yes. Well, I want to leave it there. Thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. We're going to look at the Green Party internationally next. We've been speaking with Jill Stein, who is the Green Party's 2012 pres presumptive presidential nominee. The vote will take place tomorrow here in Baltimore, where the Green Party convention is underway. We've also been joined by Sherry Hankala, perhaps the country's leading anti-poverty activist. Uh, Sherry Hankala herself uh, was uh, homeless for a time, national coordinator of the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, now the vice presidential um, presumptive nominee of the Green Party. When we come back, others who have come to the convention to talk about Green Party politics worldwide. Stay with us.